So I'm here to talk about why machines by themselves um, cannot yet tackle precision uh, medicine. Um, so, um, um, so you know, COVID uh, nineteen, uh, it's pretty scary stuff, um, and it was certainly scary back in February when we still called it the Wuhan virus, uh, if you remember uh, those days. And this is my 16-year-old uh, son, Luca. Uh, so Luca came home from school, uh, this was back in February, worried that he'd been exposed to Wuhan. Um, his friend's mother had just returned from China and I think had some, some symptoms. And I said, no, I, you know, I think that's really, really unlikely. And then four days later, uh, he started to have symptoms. Um, fortunately, uh, it turned out to be influenza B. And Luca you know, recovered quickly from the flu. But like many people, he's still pretty freaked out about COVID-19. And so, you know, he asked me about it. He said, hey, dad, doesn't coronavirus have a 3% mortality rate? Um, so I tried to calm him by explaining that averages don't apply to individuals. You know, if you're not in a vulnerable population and you don't have other diseases, your mortality risk is probably much lower. And then Luca reminded me that there had been young, healthy people um, that had already died from the, uh, this virus, uh, like the, like the uh, physician who first reported it. So I, I said somewhat dismissively, well, you know, that's probably unusual. Um, and he didn't seem too satisfied with that answer. Uh, and frankly, I wasn't either. So why are some people harder than others? And why do some respond better to certain treatments than others? Um, so these are, of course, the fundamental questions of precision medicine. You know, the idea that each person is a unique case study, an experiment with an N of one. Um, so with, you know, with HIV, um, we eventually realized that the Russians and Scandinavians who seemed to be immune were all homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Um, and, and this was transformative for treatment development. But researchers, um, the HIV researchers, had some big clues about you know, where to look when they made this discovery. But when we don't have those kinds of waypoints, there are just too many possible factors. And then the problem becomes very complex. So nowadays, we turn to artificial intelligence to help us with problems like precision medicine, where we have lots of variables and we're trying to find useful patterns. You know, but here's the truth. Today's artificial intelligence is not ready to solve the challenges of, preci of precision medicine, um, at least not by itself. But let's imagine what might happen if we tried to use AI for this. Um, so let's collect everything we know about all the coronavirus patients, their histories, their family histories, comorbidities, phenotypes, uh, genomics, biomics, proteomics, all the omics, and of course, uh, make sure to include outcomes. And then let's throw it all into a big AI grinder, turn the crank, and see what the magical pattern it discovers is. Um, problem solved, right? We're done. Um, so, so not quite so fast. So the problem is we're dealing um, with messy data. And that's far worse than big data. So big data has come to mean a lot of things that, you know, I think there's a, a new Starbucks size, you know, grande, venti, and then, and then big data. But I wanna talk about messy data. So messy data is all the stuff we're throwing in the grinder. You know, it means we're combining apples and oranges. The data is multi-source, it's heterogeneous, um, and it's very, very multi-dimensional. Um, so why is that a problem? I mean, it's AI after all. Um, the problem is there are too many possible combinations of variables to explore, more than there are particles in the known universe. So we have two choices. We can either drastically limit which patterns are explored, or we can just let the system discover an endless list of patterns. Um, so, so let's continue with our thought experiment. Let's say we have complete data on 100,000 coronavirus patients and a 1% mortality rate. So 1,000 of those people are hospitalized, were hospitalized and died. And we want to include all the variables so we keep no stones unturned. We want to find out what is so special about these patients that makes them vulnerable. So we throw all our data into our AI grinder. And can anyone guess what happens next? We find a pattern. Um, we discover that every single one of those 1,000 people has a mother whose name starts with the letter J and farts in the middle of the night. So, you know, we, we better go rush over and tell all the ED doctors so they can add this to their triage, right? So 
We're also going to discover a billion other patterns common among these 1,000 coronavirus victims. But almost all of them will be spurious, you know, just purely coincidental. So how do we winnow it down into the ones that are not just coincidental correlations, but are actually causal and actionable? You know, on the other hand, should we really throw everything into this grinder? But who decides what goes in and how do we know when something important comes out? So a colleague recently told me a story about how an AI system revealed a compound found in a study population of ALS patients. Initially, the researchers thought it might be a, a major discovery to causes and treatments of ALS. Until my colleague remembered that the compound was a Tylenol metabolite and recalled from his real world clinical experience that Tylenol is used extensively by ALS patients. So it took an expert to realize the finding was indeed a non-random random pattern, but not a helpful one. In other words, machines can discover patterns, but it takes a human to understand what a pattern means and when it's important. You know, but why? You know, why can't machines do this too? Um, so humans think differently. Um, I like to use the left brain, brain right brain metaphor um, that a lot of people are familiar with. So when it comes to left brain sort of symbolic thinking, computers are extremely reliable and quick. They also remember things very well. Humans, on the other hand, are awful at things like arithmetic and logic. So, you know, we're, we're mostly like the right brain in this left right brain paradigm. And our brains were designed by millions of years of evolution to use intuition to solve messy problems, problems that require modeling complex inter interdependent systems. But there's a catch. So this right-brained approach takes shortcuts. It sometimes misses things or, manif or manifests different forms of bias. And symbolic reasoning is really hard to do with neural networks. You know, we aren't made for that and, and being neural networks ourselves and artificial neural networks aren't made for symbolic reasoning. Um, and, and you know, I think the main reason involved in humans was so we can do, you know, we, we can have language, uh, which, which our symbolic reasoning helps with. So, so this is why we invented calculators, right, to cheat. You know, we're so poor at symbolic computation, we need help. So we created a computer that was designed and specialized to fill this specific gap. But what if we could get these simple calculators to think more like people do? You know, then we could start to automate human-like thinking, maybe even make it think like humans, but even smarter. You know, then we'd all be out of work. I, I mean, then we could automatically solve lots of problems. And, you know, AI researchers are definitely working very hard on this, but we're not there yet. And these last few things on the AI timeline are the hardest nuts to crack. So for example, let's take abstraction, you know, recognizing patterns of patterns. So a plumber, was watching a YouTube video about how to get a cork out when it's been pushed inside a bottle. Um, and I, I think the idea was you, you insert a, a plastic bag and you inflate it. Um, so he saw a parallel to a similar problem in obstetrics when babies are stuck in the birth canal and had an idea to use the same kind of approach you know, to help. And he shopped his idea around to obstetricians and eventually one of them you know, pursued the idea and it's an FDA approved product today. But imagine trying to get a machine to come up with that idea. You know, humans still far exceed machines in linking patterns across abstraction levels and domains. So AI isn't there yet, but maybe we can return the favor. So remember the student who used the calculator to cheat? What if we could let AI cheat by sneaking a human in the room to help out? You know, and that's what we're actually doing today. We find ways to insert uniquely human cognitive abilities into the AI loop where they are needed. In fact, we're building systems that effectively combine the respective strengths of humans and machines to solve problems that couldn't otherwise be solved. So for example, at the Human Computation Institute, we created an online game that anyone can play called Stall Catchers. And in Stall Catchers, uh, players look through this virtual microscope um, at blood flow uh, movies in a mouse brain um, to try to decide whether the blood flowing through the outlined capillary is flowing or stalled. You know, it's a simple two choice uh, task. Uh, and this helps advance uh, and accelerate the Alzheimer's research. But although this task is very similar in, or simple in concept, it's sometimes very hard to tell whether a blood vessel is flowing or stalled for lots of reasons. Uh, for example, we have noisy images. Sometimes we get overexposed images. Um, so this is an example of where 
the real world knowledge that humans bring to the task give humans an edge over AI. So, so before we started this project, the problem was that machine learning systems could only get about 85% of these right. And that's why we needed to bring humans in. And, and one of the reasons why humans can do better is they can look at context. So anyone who's played with a garden hose as a child knows that if water's coming out of one end of the hose, it must be going in the other end of the hose. So even if you're paying attention to what's happening inside this outline to see whether or not a blood vessel is flowing or stalled, when the vessel's overexposed, you might have to look at the context around that outlined area and know something about fluid dynamics and how that works. And that's just something we naturally understand and can bring to the problem that doesn't exist in the pixels themselves, which is what the machine learning systems are looking at. Um, so um, when we were starting the stall catchers project, trying to get it started, I brought this idea um, to um, at the NIH National Alzheimer's Summit. Summit. And uh, it was well received, and I was encouraged to to pursue it with uh, with NIH support. Um, but um, uh, there was there was skepticism at first um, among the the reviewers. So, you know, most people don't parade their grant rejections. Um, but since I know how this story ends, I kind of like to show this one. So, um, you know, at the time, and still to some extent today, the scientific community. Um, is very skeptical about the use of public volunteers for scientific data analysis. And this reviewer was concerned about exactly that, you know, saying this proposal suggests a way to harness the power of people on the internet to speed analysis, but the reliance on untrained individuals with various motivations renders the impact questionable. Um, and ironically, this was the very hypothesis we had proposed to test, <laughs> uh, whether or not we could trust data analyzed by the public. So, um, so that one didn't work out, but eventually Bright Focus Foundation gave wings to the Stall Catchers project. Um, but how do we actually ensure high quality data when non-expert members of the public are doing the analysis? So um, in this sort of canonical example, uh, at a 1906 country fair in, in Plymouth, England, 800 people, we're trying to guess the weight of a slaughtered ox. Um, I think this picture, that's not really an ox sitting there, but it, it's sort of representative um, of this kind of state fair contest. And uh, a, statistic, a statistician who looked at the data noticed that the median answer among those 800 guesses was within 1% of the correct guess. You know, and this contributed to this, this more general insight that when, the, that when there's a distribution of individual answers from people, the center of the distribution tends to align with the true value. You know, and this is what we call wisdom of crowds. So, you know, in the first few months of stall catchers, we got lots of people involved. And our goal was to analyze the data 10 times as fast as, as the lab while maintaining this very high level of accuracy in our analysis. Whoops. Um, so, um, you know, we were, at first we were only about one and a half times as fast because we were very inefficient. We had to gather answers from 20 different people um, about each vessel in order to come up with a crowd answer that would produce the level of accuracy we needed. And we were using something very similar to the, what I call the ox method, you know, using measures of central tendency like the median or the mean answer. Um, but we realized we needed help from machines to make better use of the human answers. So we improved our wisdom of crowd method. And today it takes only about five people, actually more like four people, um, per crowd answer. And stall catchers is doing analysis five times faster now than the lab with very high accuracy. So even though individual non-expert members of the general public may not analyze data as well as a scientist would, it turns out that when you combine those into a crowd-based answer, you, as we do in stall catchers, then um, the crowd answer is even better than what we find in the lab. And in fact, you know, once we validated stall catchers, you know, early in the days of the project, uh, Cornell, who's doing the Alzheimer's research, decided to give us our first data set for de novo analysis done entirely by stall catchers. And, um, and we were a little nervous, of course, uh, but we delivered the crowdsourced data analysis. Um, and then they told us they'd kept some data aside and done their own in-lab analysis just to kind of as, a, as an extra check. Um, and they were concerned because they discovered some disagreement between the crowd-produced results and their own results. So we went and, and we sat down, we looked at all, all, all the actual vessel movies together. And ultimately, in almost every case, they said the crowd was right and, and, um, and the experts even ended up having more agreement with the crowd than with each other. 
so this this was kind of a, a nice vindicating uh, result and and reinforced our methods. Um, so today, Stallcatchers has uh, about thirty thousand players. Um, we're answering new research questions every one to two months. Uh, previously, it would take the lab six months to to a year, um, and um, and. You know, we're publishing uh, these results in top tier journals. We credit the, the players in them as many other uh, projects like ours do. Um, and we're getting closer to a treatment target. Each green check mark here um, is a hypothesis related to mechanistic model leading to the treatment um, that was from some data set analyzed by stall catchers. You know, and the red question marks are the remaining questions to answer uh, toward a treatment target. Um, so, um, stall catchers is in a class of problems where microtasking is used to crowdsource a time consuming analysis that can only be done by humans. Uh, but there's another class of problems that, that I, I call optimization problems. And, and the folded game, like, like stall catchers, which is another so called citizen science project where volunteers do, do some online activity uh, to help analyze the data, has this, this characteristic where um, people are trying to um, you know, fold molecules to come up to, to come up with a better folding. Um, and um, so um, uh, Seth Cooper, who will be speaking in a bit, uh, will, will, will say a lot more about this project, which is his. Um, but in, in the case of Foldit, there, there are too many possibilities for computers to evaluate exhaustively. It's kind of like the, the grinder problem I was discussing earlier. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the humans that, that are plugged into this loop use intuition to narrow the search space. Um, and I think Seth will, will probably talk about some of the results uh, from that project, which are impressive. So AI is not ready to solve the data challenges of precision medicine by itself, but if we can figure out the best way to bring humans into the loop in partnership with AI systems, then we stand a better chance to overcome the analytic challenges posed by precision medicine. So, um, you know, you've seen just a, a couple examples of human AI partnerships that are working today, and you'll, and you'll hear about more soon from, from some of my esteemed co-panelists uh, who have firsthand, uh, you know, knowledge of them. But this, this general approach to problem solving that leverages the respective strengths of humans and machines to solve problems uh, is, is often called human computation. So the question is, how do we develop and tune human computation for precision medicine? I mean, maybe we could apply an approach like fold it to get humans to make educated guesses about how to filter what goes into our AI grinder for precision medicine, or to evaluate the many patterns that emerge from that. Um, but what kind of investment would it take just to see whether or not that would actually work? So you know, to this end, we've been building a data science ecosystem that makes it easy to create new human computation systems and then run experiments on sandboxed versions of these. So for example, before we make any improvements to the live version of the stall catchers game, we can test them out in a controlled environment to see what works best. Um, and since humans and machines think differently, we decided to see if we could figure out whether a human might do better when paired with an AI assistant that makes suggestions to the human, and then the human can decide whether or not to accept those. Um, and our, our toolkit enables experiments to be designed and run without writing any code. And that makes it possible to quickly stand these up and see results live as they trickle in. So, you know, in our first experiment, which we ran in partnership with Microsoft Research, we're seeing preliminary evidence that when paired with an AI assistant that's programmed with a certain response bias, the human combined with the AI working together is actually more accurate than the human or the AI alone. So this is very um, uh, sort of tantalizing finding. In our next experiment, we might explore an adaptive AI assistant that knows something about the, the characteristics of the human and adapts itself so they can be more uh, synergistic with each other. Um, you know, uh, uh, in another uh, initiative, um, we were looking at, at at improving machine learning for doing classification and stall catcher. So when we, be, when we began stall catchers, machine learning was, was, uh, was inadequate, as I mentioned, achieving only 85% accuracy. But realizing that machine learning has improved over the last four years, and, and we now have millions of human generated examples from stall catchers to help teach the machines, we decided to try again. Uh, and we partnered with Data Driven to run a stall catchers machine learning challenge, which resulted in 55 distinct AI systems that were demonstrating unprecedented accuracy. So then the next question is, what do we do with these models? You know, if, if they produce a confidence estimate about 
the accuracy of their of their uh, response, then we could let them tackle the easiest vessel movies and stall catchers, where they're guaranteed to be about 99% correct. And then with that kind of pre-filtering, the humans would never even have to look at about half the data, which would double our analytic throughput. So when we actually looked at some of the properties of these 55 different machine learning models that came out of the competition, we noticed something really interesting. So this is a graph showing response bias in both humans and machines, which is the tendency to say that a vessel is either flowing or stalled when all else is equal. And it turns out that the machine learning models have a response bias distribution that's very similar to our human players. And this suggests diversity in the behavior of these models. And that's diversity that could be valuable to a wisdom of crowds. So recall that wisdom of crowds relies on a, on a diversity of thinking styles. So when one person gets it wrong, several others get it right. And with many different machine-based models, we can now test what happens if we take these machine models and let them become independent stall catchers players with all the same rights and responsibilities as humans, you know, showing up on the leaderboards and getting a score and, and having their answers combined with the human answers using wisdom of crowd techniques. So another key component of this, of this kind of ecosystem we're building is the ability to connect all these pieces together. So today we're using stall catchers data to train machine learning models in a competition, and then we're manually plugging those models back into stall catchers. But with this new ecosystem, it can become a fluid and dynamic process. So the machine learning models are constantly being fed data from the humans in stall catchers. The models would be constantly improving and then taking on more of the workload as the humans are phased out, at which point they can contribute to the next you know, uh, problem we're trying to solve. Um, and and, we, and we, we have a bunch of problems lined up for sure. So you know, to learn more about this new ecosystem we're developing called Civium, um, you know, feel free to visit this, this link, bit.ly slash uh, Civium intro. Um, I think today's human AI successes were, were very hard won. Um, you'll hear from some others about this. It's, it's taken tremendous time and effort. There's a lot of failure-based learning and, the, and it's very difficult to sustain these projects. So, you know, a key goal for Civium uh, and, and the ecosystem we're building is to make it easy for everyone to put computers and humans in the same classroom, so to speak, so we can figure out the best way they can work together as lab partners and tackle key challenges like precision medicine.